Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you this morning. I bring you greetings in the name of Christ uh, from your brothers and sisters at WPC Bull Creek, uh, so just up the road. Um, and uh, I'm very glad that, you're, uh, that you could join us and that I could be a part of uh, the time together this morning. Um, this is our uh, WA Presbytery Pastor Pulpit Swap kind of thing. Uh, so that's why I'm here. And I guess one of you, is Julian somewhere else? Or? I think we, 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 uh, we, we sort of edged there. Then. You so tweet. We're, we're fortunate. We, uh, <laughs> okay, good deal. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, so we, used, we just swap around, and I'm here this morning, and it's been a while. Uh, last time I was with you guys, you were in the Nellie Regan Hall, so that would have been how many years ago now? Yeah, quite a while ago. But anyway, I bring you greetings in Christ's name. It's Still great to be here. Uh, thanks. i got a few gray hairs, but uh, yeah, anyway. Um, now, you have memorized half of this psalm already, right? Yeah. His love endures forever. You know that part. Um, we're going to cover the rest of it as well, um, and uh, we've already prayed. And uh, just to just to start us off, um, as we think about this uh, passage, um, this year was a special year for us. Um, our middle son Tyler celebrated his one-year wedding anniversary, so he got married a year ago, January. Our oldest son Kyle got married uh, this year, this January, uh, to his beautiful bride Shantae. Now the Ceremony in the ceremony, just like every other wedding ceremony you've ever been a part of, probably um, they promised something very special. These familiar words, I think most of you will have known or will have heard, to keep myself only unto you for as long as you bo- as we both shall live. What is this promising? This is a promise of faithfulness. This means that their relationship is exclusive. What they're after in their relationship as they make those vows is to keep themselves to each other in love faithfully for the rest of their life. It points to an intimate love relationship that's between my son Kyle and his wife Shantae. It's an intimacy that's reserved only for them, this love relationship. Now, Any married person does have other people in their life that they love, as you know, um, and they're supposed to. They're supposed to have other people in their life that they love. But this intimacy that we're talking about in a marriage relationship is reserved only for that husband and that wife. Another word for this promised loving fidelity is covenant love. So we're going to talk about covenant love love this morning. That's what we see in this psalm, covenant love. In Psalm 136, you repeated that phrase 26 times. And by the end of it, you're going, yep, I got it. His love endures forever. 26 times you said that. And this recurring phrase highlights the specific love that God has for his people, his covenant love. Now, way back in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 12 and 15 and 17, the Lord made covenant promises to Abraham and to all his descendants of the promise, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph. Each of Abraham's descendants then, the Israelites that descended from them, they knew God's covenant love as his steadfast love. God's covenant love for his people, then, is an exclusive love. He means it for that particular people, his people. He knows them. He knows them intimately. He loves them fully and forever. That is God's covenant love to his people, a forever kind of love. So Psalm 136, then, is telling us, telling God's people, he calls on us as his people to give thanks to God, to give thanks to the sovereign God who creates and delivers his people and who secures his people forever. So, God's steadfast love, it flows from his attributes, it's displayed in his power, and it secures his people forever. You and I know that security of God's covenant love for us. So the question this morning is, how do you and I respond to this undeserved love? How do we respond to it? 
That's what we need to answer this morning. We need to understand the passage so that we can answer that question. Well, let's go to that first point. God's steadfast love flows from his attributes. Now, this is an important one. Let's see if I can juggle this around a little bit. Um, this is an important one because the first three verses of the psalm really key us in, clue us in as to the kind of God that we would thank. So look at what it says in verse 1. It says he is good. That's a first clue, an important thing that we need to know about God, of his character, he is good. Verse 2 tells us that he is the God of gods. Now that word there is Elohim in the Hebrew, and it's the God that was at the beginning, like Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. So he is the God of gods. He's the the all-powerful God, the highest God of all. And then verse 3 tells us that he is the Lord of Lords. And that word there is Adonai. He's the master over all things. There is no higher authority is what the passage is telling us right up front. So this is a like an introduction to a, a VIP. This is the person that you and I are to turn to and thank. Unlike what we saw in Romans, where people turned their back on God, ignored God, and didn't thank Him, and didn't give Him glory, we are called here to thank Him. And this is who we are thanking. These verses help us to understand key attributes about God, key characteristics, so that we know who we are thanking. And the psalm tells us then again, God is good. Now, This is not just some good character in a novel or in a movie or in a TV. This isn't just some nice guy. It's not that kind of good. What he's actually saying here is he is the source of good. So all all that God reveals about himself, everything he tells us in his word, every thought that he has that he puts down in his word, all of his actions that are recorded in his word, tell us what good is. Define what good is. Help us to understand good. So just as one example, if you think of Genesis 1, uh, on the sixth day, God created everything. By that point, he'd created everything. And he said, this is very good, right? That's God's declaration in his word of all the work that he did. Very good. God did all the work. God was the source of all that was done and all that was made. He's the creator, and his work is very good. Now that that appears quite convenient, isn't it? God gives his own little stamp of his own work, and he says, my work is very good. Now think of it as a student. If students had that power, you know, they could get their own work, they produce their papers, they produce their tests, or whatever it is, and then they say, my work is very good. That's very convenient. But God is not like that. God's grading of of himself is not like a student. Verses 2 and 3 tell us why that's true. Verses 2 and 3 tell us why God is not just marking his own work, how convenient. God can grade his own work for this very reason. He is the God of gods and he is the Lord of lords. He's the highest authority there is. There is no higher authority. So when God says, my work is very good... You can take it to the bank. His work is very good. He is the highest authority. He's the true God. He's the master over all gods, over all authorities. There is no other authority besides His. See, taken together, we can understand that God is the highest authority. He is the sovereign, the king. Nowhere else to go. No Supreme Court, no appeal. God is the highest. So, brothers and sisters, be thankful. Be thankful because you know this God. This God has told us about himself. This God is the character that you can trust, you can depend on. This God is the God that he is love itself. He is good in himself. And he promises that he will take care of his people. He is a good God. 
You see, we need to be thankful for God's steadfast love, which flows out of His character. It flows out of who He is. See, even when I don't understand what God is doing in my life, even when things are going wrong in my life, the very thing that I can at least give thanks to God for is that I know that He is a good God. Even if I don't understand what He's doing in my life, even if I don't understand what's going on around me, even if I don't understand how is our society going so wrong and pear-shaped, even turning against Christianity, I don't understand how God can allow that, but I know that His Word tells me He is good. I can give thanks to Him for that, that He is good. Because... God is committed to love His people forever as well. Now, our God could stop there. You know, like the husband on on, on his wedding day, he says to his wife, I love you. And then, you know, later on, 10 years down the road, uh, she gets all mad at him because he's not told her he loved her in a while. And he said, well, I told you I loved her on our wedding day. You know, why why do I have to tell you? If that changes, I'll tell you. You know, Um, he's not that kind of God. He is a God that doesn't just tell us once he loves us. He shows us by his actions. And that's what he's doing here in these next few verses. He's showing us by his actions. God's steadfast love is displayed in his power. It's displayed in his power. And that's what we see from verses 4 to 22. So the bulk of this psalm is reminding us of the power of God. The Lord proved his love in creation and by overthrowing the enemies of his people. How do you know when somebody loves you? Well, it's nice when they tell you that they love you. But you really know they love you when you see their actions, when you see that confirmed in their actions and not just in their words. So Psalm 136, this 4 to 22 here, recall three displays of God's power that prove his steadfast love for his people. First, he created the heavens and the earth. Then it tells us about the fact that he delivered his people from Egypt, from bondage, from slavery. And lastly, then he brings his people into the promised land, the land that he was going to give them. So let's walk through briefly through those three sort of scenarios or this understanding recall of what God has done. First, the creation account. That's in verses 4 to 9, and he tells us right here in front of us. He talks about the events of pretty much the first four days of creation. He doesn't tell us about all of it, but he does tell us, alludes to at least four days of creation. But it's enough to put us in awe of God's power. Who else could do these wonders? Look at what he says he does. He creates the heaven. He spreads out the earth. I mean, think about it. It wasn't there, and then he spoke, and it was there. That's the power of God. So he does this great thing of making the heavens, spreading out the earth. He made the sun, the moon, and the stars. And just think about the sun for a minute. The sun that bakes us so well (laughs) in summer in Perth, right? The sun that just beats down on us. God created it. You and I couldn't do that. All of humanity together couldn't make the sun. God made the sun, placed it in the heavens, placed the stars in the heavens, the moon in the heavens. God did it. That's a powerful God. That is the powerful God. They're huge achievements that the psalmist is telling us. The psalmist is telling us, though, something more important. God did it. Why? Because his steadfast love endures forever. He created because he loves. Isn't that amazing? Can we thank God for that? Absolutely. Absolutely. See, when you see creation... When you see the things that are around you right now, when you go outside after the service during the week as you go along, you see the, the beauty of the place. You see how things fit together. You see the God loves you. You see the love of God on display in the power that it took to create what we see every day. Everything seen and even unseen. The angels that you can't see. You know they're there. You know God has told you about them. He created them. 
thank Him for those things. But we also can thank God for the way that He delivers His people. Here he's talking about the delivery of the Israelites from Egypt. And so he talks about it in verses 10 to 16. Here he displays his steadfast love once again. This time, though, he doesn't just display his love towards his people. He delivers them, but he also judges their enemies. He judged the enemies of God's people at the same time or simultaneously while he was delivering his people. So look at verse 10. What does he say? He struck down the firstborn of Egypt. That's a judgment. Verse 15, it says, He overthrew Pharaoh and his host into the Red Sea. Yet another judgment. But at the same time, verse 11 tells us that he brought Israel out from among Egypt. He delivered these people. These slaves, these people didn't have any military might, but God delivered them. God did it. Verse 13, he divided the Red Sea in two. God just stopped the waters, piled them up, and let his people pass through, is what it tells us in verse 14. He made Israel to pass through the waters safely. And then he led his people into the wilderness, this place that he promised to give them. He led them out into the wilderness so that he could take them to the promised land. Now this event helps us to understand, it helps us to correct the mistaken idea that God loves everyone. Now that may be hard to take, but his steadfast love is not for everyone. How do we know that? Well, God's covenant love is an intimate and exclusive love. It's that covenant love that we talked about at the beginning of the sermon. But when Egypt, when the Egyptian pharaoh and his armies pursued God's people, God destroyed them. God judged them, and God destroyed them. Those pagan enemies of God's people, God dealt with them in judgment at the same time while delivering his people, those that he did love. Next we see that next section here. Similarly, God shows his steadfast love to his people in this next section as he brings them into their heritage. That is the the promise that he made way back in in, uh, Genesis 12 to Abraham. He talks about the land that he promised to give to his people. And that's what we see here in verses 21 and 22. This is the land that he promised to give them. Verse 17, again, judgment and deliverance, or judgment and bringing them into the promise. Verse 17, he struck down great kings, Now, these were some really great kings. Amazingly big kings. Og. He killed mighty kings. Now, the kings that he mentions here, Og and Sihon, they are big kings. Og was nine cubits high. Now, if you don't know your cubits, you know, you don't know that metric. I mean, you don't know anything but metric. I'm sorry. But no, no. (laughs) Here's the cubits. Nine cubits is four meters tall. Four meters. That's a whole meter higher than Goliath. You know David and Goliath fame? Goliath was only three meters high. Og was four meters high. That is one big guy. And Og and Sihon were so big, can you imagine coming against them? They were scary. Not to God. God had made covenant promises to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants. So in steadfast love, He keeps his promise. Giant enemies cannot hinder God's promise to love his people. And note one more thing. It was God's earth, right? God created everything. It was God's earth. So it wasn't that Israelites stole the land from the people. It wasn't like God was was cheating the the people of, uh, of Canaan from their land. It was God's to give, and God was going to give it to his people. So God was keeping his promise giving the land that he owned to his people. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That's our God who loves his people and keeps his promise. Can you give thanks to a God like that? Of course. That's why we're called on to give thanks to our God. Now, do you know what's missing from all these accounts? 
All three accounts, all these displays of God's power. Do you know what's missing here? It's missing from creation. It's missing from this deliverance from Egypt. It's missing from the, 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 from the uh, bringing them into the promised land. Each account tells us what God did. Each time God does something in these accounts. But Israel does nothing. The record here isn't of Israel's great deeds. The, Israel, the, the record of great deeds here is God's great deeds. Israel is passive. Israel just receives these things. Israel stands back and watches God do all the work. That's the praise here. The praise goes to God alone because He's done all the work. The thanks goes to God alone because He's done it all. Thank you, God, for what you have done for your people. Musicals are not my favorite go-to form of entertainment. However, my wife and my daughter, they love musicals. So I've seen my fair share of musicals. Shelley and Ainsley have often taken me to see musicals. Now I have to admit, one of my favorite musicals, though, is Les Miserables. It's the story of Jean Valjean, who was imprisoned for about 19 years because he stole a loaf of bread. Now he was placed, he he served his 19 year sentence, and then he was paroled. And on the first night of his parole, a church bishop took Valjean in because he had nowhere to stay and nothing to eat. On the first night of his stay with the bishop, After everyone had gone to sleep, Valjean stole the silverware from the house, sold all the stole all the silverware from this bishop's house. And he ran away. Well, the police caught up with him. And he told the police that the bishop had given him the silverware. So the police bring Valjean back to the bishop to try and confirm that confirm that story. They had their suspicions. But when they got got back there, the bishop indeed confirms that he had given the silverware to Valjean. And he said to Valjean and to the policeman, in your haste to leave so early, you forgot these as well. And so he hands Valjean two large silver candlesticks, very valuable things. And he says to Valjean, God has raised you out of darkness. I have bought your soul for God. So in giving these candlesticks over, he's telling Valjean, you are forgiven and you need to change. See, by this act, the bishop displays the beautiful picture of God's steadfast love. See, like the Old Testament Israelites, Valjean doesn't deserve any of this. He doesn't earn any of this. He doesn't do anything to get God's attention, to get any of this steadfast love. However, this action, this generosity of the bishop in the Les Miserables story, but the generosity of our God in the Bible's story, should transform us. It transformed John Valjean's life. And he gives thanks to God because God alone has saved him. God alone has demonstrated steadfast love that secured him forever. You see, God's steadfast love secures his people. It saves us. And the last few verses of our passage in front of us this morning really do tell us about that. Look at some of the verses at the end of our passage. Verse 23, it tells us that God remembered us in our lowest state. Are you feeling low? Are you feeling down? Are you feeling disturbed about your sin, about about things around you, about something in your life? Are you downcast? Are you low? God remembers His people in their lowest state. Verse 24, He rescues us from all our foes. We may not see it in our lifetime, but God will deal with all of our enemies. Verse 25, he gives food to all flesh. The generosity of a God 
even when people don't care about him, don't love him, and he still feeds people. People around the world who don't care a whit about God, and God still gives. What a God. What an amazing God. See, God acts in love and gives to those in need. Those of low estate. Those in need of rescue. Those in need of food. People, you and I, who receive that kind of care, that kind of love, we should thank the God of heaven for His steadfast love that secures us forever. Now you might wonder, and what does that have to do with me? I'm not, I'm not an Israelite. You know, can God's people today give thanks to God for His attributes, for His displays of power, to know the security of His steadfast love? Has God's covenant steadfast love come to me as well? so that you and I can know this security? Well, the good news is, absolutely. Praise God, Jesus. Okay? That's the one we've come to worship today, isn't it? So turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1. We're going to look briefly and just see how Jesus fulfills all of these things that we've seen. All the power and the demonstration of God's love. We see it here in Jesus. So in John chapter 1, We see one thing right up front, early in John chapter 1, verse 3. Look what it says here. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing, not anything was made that was made. And then in verse 10 it says something similar. The world was made through Him. What are we seeing here? Jesus is the Creator. The Creator that we saw in the Old Testament, that is Jesus. What we see from the beginning in Genesis, here again, John reminds us, it's Jesus. Jesus is a powerful God. He is the God, the Creator. So we see that He's a Creator. Look at verse 17 now. What does it tell us in verse 17? The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What are those verses telling us about Jesus? They're telling us that Jesus is God's deliverer. Do you know you have been delivered from slavery? Not slavery in Egypt. Slavery to something far worse, something far more sinister, something far more destructive. You have been set free from sin. You have been delivered from death. Jesus is your deliverer. Jesus is your creator. In steadfast love, he created. Jesus is your deliverer. In steadfast love, he delivers his people. You and I who are trusting him by faith. And even better, even greater, look what it says in verse 12. But to all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood nor of the will nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but born of God see those who know Jesus by faith are brought into an intimate love relationship with God he is your father you are his children dearly loved he gave his son for you Jesus died for you You are intimately known and loved by God and you can know Him as well in Christ. You can cry out to Him, Abba, Father, because the Spirit dwells with you. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. See, the testimony of John's Gospel and of all the New Testament, really of all the Scriptures, is that Jesus is God. He's the Creator. He's the Deliverer. And He is the one who secures His people in His steadfast love forever. Everyone who knows Him by faith, not just people here, but people down through the ages, people all around Perth, and down through the ages, the Israelites even trusting ahead, looking ahead to Christ who would come and deliver His people, all of us by faith, know the steadfast love of the Lord. Rejoice. You are anchored 
in his steadfast love, brothers and sisters. Resist temptation to doubt God's steadfast love. He has delivered you and takes care of you forever. That's his promise, and he will do it. Remember, his character is good and powerful. Stand firm in the times of trial and persecution. And most of all, thank him. Thank him because his steadfast love endures forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are indeed so grateful. Your steadfast love endures forever. Lord, we are so thankful for your kindness and your grace and your mercy. Lord, that you would deal with our enemies, but also rescue us at the same time on the cross. Lord, we we cannot fathom the depths of your love, but help us, Lord, to know it, to sense it, and to confidently trust and give you thanks. Lord, for any here who don't know you yet, I pray, Lord, that you would open their eyes, open their hearts, change their hearts by your Spirit's power so that they might know the steadfast love of the Lord that endures forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.